Samsara. For a long time, Siddhartha had lived the life of the world without belonging to it. His senses, which he had deadened during his ardent samana years, were again awakened. He had tasted riches, passion, and power, but for a long time he remained a samana in his heart. Clever Kamala had recognized this. His life was always directed by the art of thinking, waiting, and fasting. The people of the world, the ordinary people, were still alien to him, just as he was apart from them. The years passed by. Enveloped by comfortable circumstances, Siddhartha hardly noticed their passing. He had become rich. He had long possessed a house of his own and his own servants, and a garden at the outskirts of the town, by the river. People liked him. They came to him if they wanted money or advice. However, with the exception of Kamala, he had no close friends. That glorious, exalted awakening which he had experienced in his youth, in the days after Gotama's preaching, after the parting from Govinda, that alert expectation, that pride of standing alone without teachers and doctrines, that eager readiness to hear the divine voice within his own heart, had gradually become a memory, had passed. The only fountainhead which had once been near and which had once sung loudly within him, now murmured softly in the distance. However, many things which he had learned from the Samanas, which he had learned from Gotama, from his father, from the Brahmins, he still retained for a long time. A moderate life, pleasure in thinking, hours of meditation, secret knowledge of the self, of the eternal self, that was neither body nor consciousness. Many of these he had retained. Others were submerged and covered with dust. Just as the potter's wheel, once set in motion, still turns for a long time and then turns only very slowly and stops, so did the wheel of the ascetic, the wheel of thinking, the wheel of discrimination still revolved for a long time in Siddhartha's soul. It still revolved, but slowly and hesitatingly it had nearly come to a standstill. Slowly, like moisture entering the dying tree trunk, slowly filling and rotting it, so did the world and inertia creep into Siddhartha's soul. It slowly filled his soul, made it heavy, made it tired, sent it to sleep, but on the other hand, his senses became more awakened. They learned a great deal, experienced a great deal. Siddhartha had learned how to transact business affairs, to exercise power over people, to amuse himself with women. He had learned to wear fine clothes, to command servants, to bathe in sweet-smelling waters. He had learned to eat sweet and carefully prepared foods, also fish and meat and fowl, spices and dainties, and to drink wine which made him lazy and forgetful. He had learned to play dice and chess, to watch dancers, to be carried in sedan chairs, to sleep on a soft bed. But he had always felt different from and superior to the others. He had always watched them a little scornfully, with a slightly mocking disdain, with that disdain which a samana always feels toward the people of the world. If Kamaswami was upset, if he felt that he had been insulted, or if he was troubled with his business affairs, Siddhartha had always regarded him mockingly. But slowly and imperceptibly, with the passing of the seasons, his mockery and feeling of superiority diminished. Gradually, along with his growing riches, Siddhartha himself acquired some of the characteristics of the ordinary people, some of their childishness, and some of their anxiety. And yet he envied them. The more he became like them, the more he envied them. He envied them the one thing that he lacked and that they had, the sense of importance with which they lived their lives, the depths of their pleasures and sorrows, the anxious but sweet happiness of their continual power to love. These people were always in love with themselves, with their children, with honor or money, with plans or hope. But these he did not learn from them. 
these childlike pleasures and follies. He only learned the unpleasant things from them which he despised. It happened more frequently that after a merry evening he lay in bed the following morning and felt dull and tired. He would become annoyed and impatient when Kamaswami bored him with his worries. He would laugh too loudly when he lost at dice. His face was still more clever and intellectual than other people's, but he rarely laughed, and gradually his face assumed the expressions which are so often found among rich people, the expressions of discontent, of sickliness, of displeasure, of idleness, of lovelessness. Slowly the soul sickness of the rich crept over him. Like a veil, like a thin mist, a weariness settled on Siddhartha slowly, every day a little thicker, every month a little darker, every year a little heavier. As a new dress grows old with time, loses its bright color, becomes stained and creased, the hems frayed and here and there weak and threadbare places, so had Siddhartha's new life, which he had begun after his parting from Govinda, become old. In the same way, it lost its color and sheen with the passing of the years. Creases and stains accumulated, and hidden in the depths, here and there already appearing, waited disillusionment and nausea. Siddhartha did not notice it. He only noticed that the bright and clear inward voice that had once awakened him and had always guided him in his finest hours had become silent. The world had caught him. Pleasure covetousness, idleness, and finally also that vice that he had always despised and scorned as the most foolish, acquisitiveness. Property, possessions, and riches had also finally trapped him. They were no longer a game and a toy. They had become a chain and a burden. Siddhartha wandered along a strange, twisted path of this last and most base declivity through the game of dice. Since the time he had stopped being a samana in his heart, Siddhartha began to play dice for money and jewels with increasing fervor, a game in which he had previously smilingly and indulgently taken part as a custom of the ordinary people. He was a formidable player. Few dared play with him, for his stakes were so high and reckless. He played the game as a result of a heartfelt need, he derived a passionate pleasure through the gambling away and squandering of wretched money. In no other way could he show more clearly and mockingly his contempt for riches, the false deity of businessmen. So he staked high and unsparingly, hating himself, mocking himself. He won thousands, he threw thousands away, lost money, lost jewels, lost a country house, won again, lost again. He loved that anxiety, that terrible and oppressive anxiety which he experienced during the game of dice, during the suspense of high stakes. He loved this feeling and continually sought to renew it, to increase it, to stimulate it, for in this feeling alone did he experience some kind of happiness, some kind of excitement, some heightened living in the midst of his satiated, tepid, insipid existence. And after every great loss, he devoted himself to the procurement of new riches, went eagerly after business, and pressed his debtors for payment, for he wanted to play again. He wanted to squander again. He wanted to show his contempt for riches again. Siddhartha became impatient at losses. He lost his patience with slow-paying debtors. He was no longer kind-hearted to beggars. He had no desire to give gifts and loans to the poor. He who staked ten thousand on the throw of the dice and laughed became more hard and mean in business and sometimes dreamt of money at night. And whenever he awakened from this hateful spell, when he saw his face reflected in the mirror on the wall of his bedroom, grown older and uglier, whenever shame and nausea overtook him, he fled again fled to a new game of chance, fled in confusion to passion, to wine, and from there back again to the urge for acquiring and hoarding wealth. 
He wore himself out in this senseless cycle, became old and sick. Then a dream once reminded him. He had been with Kamala in the evening, in her lovely pleasure garden. They sat under a tree, talking. Kamala was speaking seriously, and grief and weariness were concealed behind her words. She had asked him to tell her about Gotama, and could not hear enough about him, how clear his eyes were, how peaceful and beautiful his mouth, how gracious his smile, how peaceful his entire manner. For a long time he had to talk to her about the illustrious Buddha, and Kamala had sighed and said, One day, perhaps soon, I will also become a follower of this Buddha. I will give him my pleasure garden and take refuge in his teachings. But then she enticed him, and in love play she clasped him to her with extreme fervor, fiercely and tearfully, as if she wanted once more to extract the last sweet drop from this fleeting pleasure. Never had it been so strangely clear to Siddhartha how closely related passion was to death. Then he lay beside her, and Kamala's face was near to his, and under her eyes and near the corners of her mouth he read clearly for the first time a sad sign, fine lines and wrinkles, a sign which gave a reminder of autumn and old age. Siddhartha himself, who was only in his forties, had noticed gray hairs here and there in his black hair. Weariness was written on Kamala's beautiful face, weariness from continuing along a long path which had no joyous goal, weariness and incipient old age, and concealed and not yet mentioned, perhaps a not yet conscious fear, fear of the autumn of life, fear of old age, fear of death. Sighing, he took leave of her, his heart full of misery and secret fear. Then Siddhartha had spent the night at his house with dancers and wine, had pretended to be superior to his companions, which he no longer was. He had drunk much wine, and late after midnight he went to bed, tired and yet agitated, nearly in tears and in despair. In vain did he try to sleep. His heart was so full of misery he felt he could no longer endure it. He was full of nausea, which overpowered him like a distasteful wine, or music that was too sweet and superficial, or like the too sweet smile of the dancers, or the too sweet perfume of their hair and breasts. But above all, he was nauseated with himself, with his perfumed hair, with the smell of wine from his mouth, with the soft flabby appearance of his skin, like one who has eaten and drunk too much and vomits painfully and then feels better, so did the restless man wish he could rid himself with one terrific heave of these pleasures, of these habits, of this entirely senseless life. Only at daybreak, and at the first signs of activity outside his townhouse, did he doze off and had a few moments of semi-oblivion, a possibility of sleep. During that time he had a dream. Kamala kept a small, rare songbird in a small golden cage. It was about this bird that he dreamt. This bird, which usually sang in the morning, became mute, and as this surprised him, he went up to the cage and looked inside. The little bird was dead and lay stiff on the floor. He took it out, held it a moment in his hand, and then threw it away on the road, and at the same moment he was horrified and his heart ached as if he had thrown away with this dead bird all that was good and of value in himself. Awakening from this dream, he was overwhelmed by a feeling of sadness. It seemed to him that he had spent his life in a worthless and senseless manner. He retained nothing vital, nothing in any way precious or worthwhile. He stood alone, like a shipwrecked man on the shore. Sadly, Siddhartha went to a pleasure garden that belonged to him, closed the gates, sat under a mango tree, and felt horror and death in his heart. He sat and felt himself dying, withering, finishing. Gradually, 
He collected his thoughts and mentally went through the whole of his life from the earliest days which he could remember. When had he really been happy? When had he really experienced joy? Well, he had experienced this several times. He had tasted it in the days of his boyhood, when he had won praise from the Brahmins, when he far outstripped his contemporaries, when he excelled himself at the recitation of the holy verses, in argument with the learned men, when assisting at the sacrifices. Then he had felt in his heart, A path lies before you which you are called to follow. The gods await you. And again as a youth, when his continually soaring goal had propelled him in and out of the crowd of similar seekers, when he had striven hard to understand the Brahmin's teachings, when every freshly acquired knowledge only engendered a new thirst, then again, in the midst of his thirst, in the midst of his efforts, he had thought, Onwards, onwards, this is your path. He had heard this voice when he had left his home and chosen the life of the Samanas, and again when he had left the Samanas and gone to the Perfect One, and also when he had left him for the unknown. How long was it now since he had heard this voice, since he had soared to any heights? How flat and desolate his path had been! How many long years he had spent without any lofty goal, without any thirst, without any exaltation, content with small pleasures and yet never really satisfied. Without knowing it, he had endeavored and longed all these years to be like all these other people, like these children, and yet his life had been much more wretched and poorer than theirs, for their aims were not his, nor their sorrows his. This whole world of the Kamaswami people had only been a game to him, a dance, a comedy which one watches. Only Kamala was dear to him, had been of value to him. But was she still? Did he still need her? And did she still need him? Were they not playing a game without an end? Was it necessary to live for it? No. This game was called samsara, a game for children, a game which was perhaps enjoyable played once, twice, ten times, but was it worth playing continually? Then Siddhartha knew that the game was finished, that he could play it no longer. A shudder passed through his body. He felt as if something had died. He sat all that day under the mango tree, thinking of his father, thinking of Govinda, thinking of Gotama. Had he left all these in order to become a Kamaswami? He sat there till night fell. When he looked up and saw the stars, he thought, I am sitting here under my mango tree in my pleasure garden. He smiled a little. Was it necessary? Was it right? Was it not a foolish thing that he should possess a mango tree and a garden? He had finished with that. That also died in him. He rose, said farewell to the mango tree and the pleasure garden. As he had not had any food that day, he felt extremely hungry and thought of his house in the town, of his room and bed, of the table with food. He smiled wearily, shook his head, and said goodbye to these things. The same night, Siddhartha left his garden and the town and never returned. For a long time, Kamaswami tried to find him, believing he had fallen into the hands of bandits. Kamala did not try to find him. She was not surprised when she learned that Siddhartha had disappeared. Had she not always expected it? Was he not a Samana, without a home, a pilgrim? She had felt it more than ever at their last meeting, and in the midst of her pain at her loss, she rejoiced that she had pressed him so close to her heart on that last occasion, had felt so completely possessed and mastered by him. When she heard the first news of Siddhartha's disappearance, she went to the window where she kept a rare songbird in a golden cage. She opened the door of the cage, took the bird out, and let it fly away. 
For a long time she looked after the disappearing bird. From that day she received no more visitors and kept her house closed. After a time she found that she was with child as a result of her last meeting with Siddhartha.